This is Weights and Wealth, your one-stop shop for entertaining education on building a stronger body and bank account. We are not doctors or financial advisors, and must warn you this is not medical or investing advice. It is for your entertainment. Welcome back to Weights and Wealth. We have been waiting to uh, do this episode. This episode is going to be a deep dive on testosterone. It's going to be a little bit of an intro to the ebook that we are releasing. Uh, just again, in case you haven't heard, this is an ebook that's roughly around 40 pages. It's got over 100 studies uh, cited in it. It's very in depth, but it's also written so that uh, a beginner that doesn't have a science background can understand it. I mean, Nick has mm-hmm. been editing it for me because uh, yeah. I did the writing, but my uh, I'm, I'm not very good with first and second person. So Nick mm-hmm. has to do a lot of editing of it. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like I enjoy editing things. I'm a kind of a grammar nerd as well. So <laughs> kind of fun, but I'm also trying to focus on improving the content as well. Like asking you to explain things deeper that I have questions on. Mm-hmm. But um, essentially, it's written to our audience. So uh, it uses a lot of analogies and kind of breaks down some of the science so that a beginner can understand. So uh, be sure to head to our website or DM us your email and we will get that free ebook out to you. And it's free. And we are trying to come out with more free stuff for you guys. Um, we originally planned on doing one a month. That turned out to be too much. You might yeah. go to like one a quarter. It took me like over 200 hours to write this. Ebook, yeah. So it's a lot of time, but <laughs> mine's coming up next. Like I'm going to do the next one. So I'm looking for ideas. I was planning on doing something for small business accounting, but if anybody else has something else that they would rather me do, I'd be happy to. Um, so just let us know about that. All right. Our shout out for today is Roy from from Watertown, New York. Roy has shared our podcast with several of his friends and uh, he was also active on sharing us on social media. So thank you, Roy. Uh, You get a raffle entry and uh, we appreciate you listening and sharing the show. Mm -hmm. This week's wealth wisdom is to get a credit card as soon as you turn 18. Because one of the factors in building credit is the length of your credit. Um, and this will help you start doing that just as soon as possible. I think it takes seven years for you to actually max out that category. So once you have it for seven years of good credit, it will really help your credit score. Some good wealth wisdom, Nick. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Moving on to our intro article for today. Uh, It's an article about some LIDAR discoveries in the Guatemalan rainforest. So uh, basically LIDAR is kind of like radar, but they shine light through the tree canopies and then they're able to see what's underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there is a 650 square mile area that they found an ancient city buried. Yeah. Ancient Mayan city with over a hundred settlements in this ginormous area. So Uh, This is a pretty cool discovery if you're interested in all the ancient civilization uh, type of stuff that Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson talk about. Yeah, I know Italy has a big problem with wanting to build something and then they start digging and then they find Roman ruins. (laughs) So so for like building like water pipes or a new building, they have a lot of problem with that. Yeah. Um, And I would bet in South America, especially in those rainforests, they would do would find something similar. Mm hmm. Uh, Next up, if you are watching, we will include pictures. If you are listening, we will try to describe the murder, the atrocity that occurred. So uh, maybe head to YouTube or open up your video on Spotify on this one, but uh, we'll post pictures. I went to a barbershop a few weeks ago. I was in quick need of a haircut and uh, my normal barbershop was closed, so... I went on to Yelp and started looking at the nearby barbershops and a specific barbershop caught my eye because it was entirely five star and one star reviews. (laughs) And the reviews were absolutely hilarious because they all talked about the man on the left and said, don't get in this guy's chair. But then a lot of the reviews were like, this guy's so good. He's the only person in Charleston that can give a decent haircut. 
So I was like, all right, I'm not really, <laughs> not really sure if this is going to be horrible or really good, but my hair grows back really quickly. So I'll just go, <laughs> I'll just go do it and we'll see what happens. And he butchered my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're watching, you can see the pictures. But basically, I went in asking for a medium to high skin fade, and he took it all the way up and started using clippers like on the top of my head. And in, I asked for none off the top, and instantly I was just sitting there like, "Oh no, what have I gotten myself?" <laughs> <laughs> So I also have a haircut story that actually made me think of another one. Recently during tax season, I was in a pinch and I went to a barbershop. It was closed. So I let my sister cut it. I go into work Monday and everybody's like, oh, Nick, I love your haircut in your typical like Southern lady, bless your heart type voice. And I was like, I knew it was bad, but then I knew it was really bad. <laughs> Um, and then we also got, when I went to visit Pat Hessian in Boston, I was used to living in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and I got my hair cut. And when the guy told me it was $40, I thought he was messing with me. <laughs> and I like laughed and I was like waiting for him to say, no, it's actually 20. And I was just waiting there. I gave him a look like you're, you're messing with me. Right. And he wasn't. So <laughs> welcome to the big city. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get into testosterone. So. Uh, we just mentioned the ebook. The ebook will go a lot more into depth. Uh, in this episode, we'll just cover uh, some of the basics here and some steps you can take. Oops, sorry for the microphone sound there. All right, so first off, uh, testosterone levels have been drastically, drastically declining, uh, especially in America over the past 40, 50 years. We do have a decent amount of long term data. And if you look at the average 22 year old right now and compare them to say like a 58 or 60 year old from uh, the late 80s, their testosterone levels are uh, the same. I think if I, uh, let me just check on the statistics. Yeah, um, so basically what that is showing is that our young men who are supposed to have really high testosterone levels are having the same testosterone levels as elderly men from 40 years ago or 30 years ago. So um, a lot of people will also cite a statistic that testosterone levels are dropping 1% a year. Uh, this is kind of alarming because over time this winds up being a huge difference and testosterone is really important for men's health, not just for their performance and aesthetics, but for your health in general and uh, being able to function properly. If you have low testosterone, it can really wreak havoc on your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and testosterone, I believe, is also important to women as well. It is, yep. Uh, they have much lower amounts because uh, they don't have testicles that produce <laughs> testosterone. Uh, so most of men's testosterone is produced in the testicles, but then uh, your adrenals also make a small amount. So that's where women's testosterone comes from. Do you know anything on the on how women's levels have been doing? Because I think my I don't know she like, like this might be wrong, but she said they've been going up. Which oh okay, uh, well so some women can also suffer from low testosterone. Um, and that can also have effects on them as far as, um, like energy levels and mood and then also weight gain. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I was, I'm not aware of anything that says women's levels are going up. Well, okay. They have high yeah. testosterone, like in the case of, uh, PCOS, PCOS. Yeah. Um, there are definitely issues with a lot of women having high testosterone. So I guess, yeah, maybe they are going up or maybe it's just the people that have PCOS, but PCOS is a growing issue. Mm -hmm. Um, but women's hormones are a lot, a lot more complicated than oh, men's yeah. hormones. Um, I mean, even just like the fact that you can look at a man's like daily cycle, like testosterone mm -hmm. highest in the morning and then drops throughout the day. Whereas women, it's like this month long month. cycle with multiple hormones. So, um, all the things that we'll be talking about today, as well as the ebook is geared just towards men. Um, that's not to say that some of the information as far as how to have healthy testosterone levels won't apply to women as well. Um, but all the statistics are done on men. There were a lot of studies I came across, including a lot of studies that other people, uh, especially some of like the supplement studies that other people will cite 
that were done on like postmenopausal women. That's not the same population we're looking at. So I didn't use any of those studies. I threw those studies out when I was looking at studies. Mm -hmm. uh, I only used studies that were looking at men or in one portion of the ebook, I did use animal studies, but uh, I said that up front and went through it as, as Nick knows. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, um, I guess we can get into how to have healthy testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. um, I guess first I can say that um, I was able to raise my testosterone levels 69% by mm -hmm. following, th that's actually the real number. <laughs> it went from 484 to above 800 uh, through incorporating these uh, lifestyle choices. Um, but a disclaimer to that is that that was post ranger school. So my testosterone levels were high before ranger school and then they crashed at ranger school and then I got them back up. But it does show that you can improve your testosterone levels. Did you say 44 to over 800? 484. 484. Okay. Yep. Okay. I was going to say because the math isn't mathing if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first thing that we'll start off with, because we'll go in order of most important to least important here. So uh, the most important thing you can do to reliably increase your testosterone levels is lift. Uh, resistance training has a large effect on your testosterone levels. When you when you look at studies, a lot of times they will take the uh, increase in testosterone like in a brief snapshot around your workout. When you look at those statistics, you can't really use them because uh, your testosterone comes back down. It doesn't just stay elevated after after, <clears throat> after you work out once. So just working out once that will raise your testosterone in the short term very acutely but then it will come back down okay right but what like what what does acute mean oh acute like, is like very like uh, short like oh for oh as in time period or like the amount yes. that it goes up um both both really um but essentially what uh lifting does is it sends a signal to your body to increase muscle mass right that's i mean we talk about that all the time um but in terms of how you can lift to properly increase your testosterone levels, uh, there are different things you can do. So when you look at cardio versus lifting, lifting will have a much bigger effect on your testosterone levels than cardio. If you look at exercise in general, if you're sedentary, any type of exercise will increase your testosterone levels, but lifting will do it quite a bit more than cardio will. Um, if someone were to be lifting pretty consistently and then start doing cardio, do you know what would happen? Would it have any effect? Would it lower or would it higher? On testosterone levels, I can't say. I don't have mm -hmm. any studies that uh, show anything like that. Um, but some studies that compare like aerobic to testosterone levels, um, I found like 12 months on an aerobic exercise regimen. Uh, that would be like cardio uh, mm -hmm. can increase your testosterone levels like eight to ten percent, whereas mm -hmm. uh, doing four weeks of low intensity lifting was increasing some people's testosterone thirty to forty percent. Oh wow! So okay. it is a big difference, um, and something's better than nothing, but lifting's the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you also don't want to be overtraining, so it's important that you're not overstressing your body and doing too much. Would that lower testosterone if you yes. are overtraining? It does. Yeah, that's one of the problems with overtraining is it can affect your hormones because your HPA axis, uh, which we will get into later, uh, basically you're overloading it and your body's too stressed. So it's not producing hormones t for the positive adaptation. Okay. So um, my recommendations for uh, lifting to increase testosterone is three to four times a week lifting moderate to heavy weights. Uh, that's what I found in the studies to be most supportive for testosterone levels. And then the other big thing that I think people really miss with uh, exercise for testosterone levels is going on walks, getting your steps in. So you, you don't want to be sedentary the whole day and then just be active for the one hour at the gym. Mm -hmm. um, there are also studies that show that steps are very important for your testosterone levels. A, uh, a recent 2022 study showed that 8 to 12,000 steps a day made huge differences for things like obesity, 
diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. And if you have any of those risk factors, they're going to dampen your testosterone levels. So if you're walking eight to 12,000 steps a day and you're lowering any conditions like that that you have, it's going to improve your testosterone levels. Yeah, I've, I've been really trying to up my walking post-tax season recently, and I've, I've been hitting right around 10,000 a day, which is my goal. So yeah, we, we've been that. trying to record a bunch of episodes at once here <laughs> and Nick leaves to go on a walk mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're like, no, we need to record. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on to the next most important thing you can do for your testosterone levels. We've got sleep. Sleep is really, really critical for supporting your testosterone levels. I'm not sure about you, Nick, but Uh, When I was in high school and beginning of college, I was one of those kids that was like, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Sleep is for the week. I was always running on like three, four, five hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that I wasn't that guy, especially (laughs) in college. (laughs) Nick would always be sleeping in. (laughs) Yes, always sleeping in. Um, But recently I've had issues sleeping, especially in the summertime. That it's it's tough for me to the most I'll get seven and a half, but it could be anywhere from like four to that seven and a half Mm -hmm. um and i think the statistics are that less than six you are starting to damage your brain a little bit if you have that for a while as well as Mm -hmm. testosterone levels so i've been trying to figure out how to fix my sleep dr andrew huberman has a great podcast on that and i'm trying to incorporate some of his stuff um i've been using melatonin a little bit which i know it's generally recommended against Mm -hmm. don't know if that affects your testosterone it may it does if you are in puberty so uh, like young teenage men i would suggest not using melatonin because it will impact your testosterone levels Mm. um but yeah so i'm trying to avoid that and starting to use his other tactics Mm -hmm. i don't know did you want to go over some of them or yeah we can can... can go into sleep so um real quick just to uh before we get into fixing sleep uh going over the quantity of sleep issue if uh, there, there's a study done that showed when people went from having eight hours of sleep a night to five hours of sleep a night, their testosterone levels decreased by 10 to 15% immediately. So right off the bat, that's a pretty big difference in testosterone levels. And then there was also another study uh, where they found that just one night of having like an all nighter and staying up all night reduced testosterone levels by 30%. So, wow. and does it do, and do they go back up? Yeah, they can go back up if you get okay. more sleep. But if you're constantly running on mm. low sleep, then it's going to constantly be low. So, uh, testosterone for men is really made when you go into REM sleep. So, especially the first REM cycle that you hit at night, REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. So, you can think of it as like deep sleep, I guess. Um, but During that first cycle is when the largest amount of your testosterone is made. And then consecutive REM cycles, you keep making more testosterone. So this is why when you wake up in the morning, you usually have morning wood if you're healthy and Mm -hmm. you have high testosterone levels uh, because your testosterone is made overnight and it peaks in the morning and then it pretty much just goes down from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for, for males, I've heard that is a pretty much a hallmark of good health. Like if you don't have that, then you are probably not in good health. Yeah. So, um, like when I train clients, um, one of the things on like a daily check-in form for the male clients is, is that (laughs) cause I want to know how they're doing. Like that's a, um, it it can almost Mm. be used as a health metric for men. I could not be a doctor. I could not ask somebody that with a straight face. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if, if you are not comfortable talking about it with someone, then it's not going to work. But mm. if you get comfortable talking about it, then yeah, yeah if, if you're awkward about it then the client's not going to feel comfortable, yeah. so you just have to not be awkward about it. Mm-hmm. I did have one client that would just put like emojis and he would use like the eggplant emoji. Like up or down, like the up. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. That was a fun one. <laughs> all right so um another thing that you can do um i guess we should get into sleep quality so 
I talked about how your REM cycles are really important for producing testosterone. So the way that you can get more time in REM sleep is you can sleep for longer and hope to get more REM cycles, or you can have better sleep quality, right? Because if you're sleeping for a long period of time, but you're not getting good sleep and you're not going into the deeper stages of sleep, stage three, stage four, and getting that REM sleep, then you're not hitting the points in sleep when your testosterone is being made. So this is where sleep quality becomes a big deal. And this is where uh, something like Andrew Huberman's podcast mm-hmm. is very helpful, right? So, yeah, yeah, we, we, we talked about maybe doing one completely like an entire podcast on sleep mm-hmm. and mostly plagiarizing Huberman's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I am. But the advice is correct in yes. my opinion. So, I mean, we'll be talking about the same things if we do an entire podcast on sleep. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just like REM sleep, the amount of REM sleep you get makes a big difference. And a 2001 study on testosterone and sleep found that one less hour of REM sleep total in a night decreased testosterone levels by 40%. So that just goes to show how critical REM sleep is. Mm -hmm. So if you are, a lot of people will say they get eight hours of sleep but their sleep quality isn't good because they were drinking caffeine late in the day or they were on their phone before they went to bed. Uh, There are things that will mess with your circadian rhythm that will decrease your sleep quality. So whenever you're thinking of sleep quality, I want you to think circadian rhythm, right? Your body has a natural preset rhythm with the light that determines your sleep and your wakefulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned the light, lights also very important or the lack thereof light is very important to getting quality sleep as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that's why a lot of people get blue light blocking glasses if they have to go on their phone or laptop at night. Um, I mean, it's also not a bad habit just to try to turn your phone off an hour before bed. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, blue light, you want to try to avoid it before bed. A lot of people will say, try to uh, stop using screens two hours before bed. Uh, I know with a lot of people's lifestyles, that's very difficult. So if you can't stop using uh, your screens before bed, then blue light blocking glasses is a good mm-hmm. idea. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say this earlier, but I also wanted to mention that like, like my own hard and fast rule on caffeine is that I don't go over four cups a day and nothing after 12. Okay. And because yeah. I mean, like in high school, I would sometimes take pre-workout before my workouts and that's at like three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And that really started messing with my sleep. I mean, I'm probably drinking four is a lot of caffeine and I want to dial it back, but I don't think that is the main cause of my sleep. Pro- I mean, it could be. But. Yeah. I mean, moving on to caffeine, there's a uh, 2013 study that I referenced in the ebook that showed that like it had... It tested caffeine at uh, different times before bed, like a T minus kind of time. So zero, one, three, six. And even at like taking caffeine six hours before bed, um, that group still had like a 15% chance uh, less REM Mm -hmm. sleep. So caffeine, even six hours before bed will still affect your quality of sleep. Okay. Did it, did it go into the milligrams at all? Cause I know caffeine has a half-life of about eight hours. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you're drinking, you know, 40 milligrams at noon, that'd be the same as drinking 80 milligrams at, I guess, 4 a.m. Is that correct? Or Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, because I, if you're blasting yourself with 500 milligrams at noon, you're still going to have a lot in your system when you're going to sleep. Yeah. I know the study referenced how much uh, was used, but I don't, I don't remember how mm-hmm. much it was. Um, I would guess probably only a cup of coffee. Yeah, I know it wasn't like a minuscule amount. It was like a standard amount, I think, of caffeine. Mm. Uh, Let's see. What else have we got for sleep? Um, Your environment. Another thing you can do is you can adjust your bedroom environment. You want to sleep in a cool, dark place. Uh, A lot of people have light pollution in their rooms. So you want to If you need to get blackout curtains, you can do that, Um, but you really wanna get all the lights off so that it's nice and dark. And then you also want to be in a cool space. Uh, The studies done on sleep and temperature show that most people, it's optimal to be around 68 degrees. Uh, So 
you want to get your room cool and I know a lot of people just from being in other people's houses they somehow like their houses to be above 70 degrees hmm. not me but <laughs> I can tell you from sleeping here last night Ted likes it cold very cold <laughs> the colder the better <laughs> um yeah, well, were you, were, did you need an extra blanket last night, Nick? I could have used a third, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, you're going to have to find out what temperature works best for you, but generally uh, sleeping in colder temperatures is going to be better. So uh, make sure that you either have AC or you use fans or something. I know um, not everyone uses a lot of AC because of the cost, but if you're not going to use AC and you are in a warmer climate, you might want to look into getting some fans. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing I don't mind spending my money on is to ensure that I have quality sleep. Cause I think AC is a low cost to pay for feeling very good throughout the day. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, have you seen anything on getting too much sleep and how that affects the testosterone levels? Cause I know there are some pretty adverse effects for, because so, everybody needs a different amount of sleep. It's mm -hmm. all by person. But once you start hitting like 10, 11 hours in a night, that's when you start having poor effects on your brain, I believe. And when, okay, so I'm I'm like a bear kind of. I sleep a lot in the winter. I hibernate. And then in the summer, I don't sleep very much. I don't know if it's the light. There's like sun exposure, something like that. But past couple of years, that, that, that's been the trend. And I can sleep up to like 10 hours a night in the summer or winter. And I just feel tired all day long. So, and I don't feel as sharp either. Maybe you have the, uh, what is it, seasonal depressive disorder? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Do you take a vitamin D supplement in the winter? I have tried vitamin D supplement. I don't, it was like a nature made brand. So I don't know if I was taking a good vitamin D supplement. I also, you're supposed to take that with K2. K2. Magnesium. And I don't think I was taking either of those. Yeah. So this coming winter, I plan on trying those three as well as red light therapy to see if that helps me. And I will report back. If you don't want to take a K2 supplement in addition to a D3 supplement, you can just eat some cheese with your D3 supplement. Okay. Okay. There I'll try go. that out. Yeah. <laughs> Does liver have any of that K2? For some reason, I thought I don't... Um, I always just think of like vitamin A and iron with yeah. liver, but I mean, liver's got everything. So uh, maybe our producer can bring up how much K2 is in liver. There's, I got to assume there's some just because it's high in pretty much everything. I mean, it's it's a super food. Yeah. It is probably one of probably the best food for you. I think that was one of the good things that came out of Liver King. It did expose mm -hmm. more people to eating organ meats. It did. Raw is not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> Cook your liver. It doesn't taste good either. Like I have yeah. to douse it in mustard to get it down. Um, um, I just want to hit on one more thing with sleep and sleep quality. Uh, I learned this in, I think, my level two nutrition uh, certification through NCI. So I had taken quite a few nutrition courses before I actually learned this, but uh, studies will show that if you eat up to three hours before sleep, it's going to disrupt your sleep quality. Mm -hmm. So um, in the past, before I took that course, if you had asked me if eating at night, like before bed, like dessert or something like that is going to affect your like weight or fat loss goals or anything like that i would have said oh no just make sure like it, it's more about the calories and the protein mm -hmm. um but now i tell people like if you can avoid eating before bed that's probably preferred uh, i did come across one study that looked at how many times people woke up in the night which is a measurement you can use for sleep quality right because if you're waking mm -hmm. up then you have to start your sleep cycle all over right because you're coming mm -hmm. out of deep sleep so uh, I did find a study that looked at eating before bed and nighttime awakenings and it showed that if you eat within three hours before bed it on average will increase nocturnal awakening by 45 percent wow so that has uh, an effect on sleep quality so mm -hmm. uh, the big recommendations here for your sleep quality uh, not just getting more sleep but the quality of your sleep and getting into that REM sleep is to 
uh, respect your circadian rhythm and sleep at normal nighttime hours. I was and, just about to ask, is there any like recommended time to go to bed and wake up or whether to set an alarm or not? Yeah. So, uh, with your circadian rhythm, the most important thing I touch on this in the ebook is, or not the most important thing, but something that's really important is your consistency with your uh, bedtime and your awakening time. So if you can go to bed and wake up at consistent times and you're not like going to bed early and then waking up early in the weekdays and then staying up really late at night and sleeping in on the weekends, like that will impact your circadian rhythm because your body will have trouble finding a baseline, right? Mm -hmm. Your body wants consistency with that. So, uh, going for the same time and consistency. And then also the other big thing is light for your circadian rhythm, right? So after it gets dark, go to bed. And then when you wake up, uh, try to get some light in the morning when you wake up. And I know Huberman, I haven't listened to a lot of Huberman's podcasts, but in like the two or three that I have listened to, he talks about getting light in the morning. Yeah, I mean, this up, is a very so. condensed version basically of what he talks about. He goes very deep into the science of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is a condensed version, essentially. For the sleep part? Yep. Yeah, for the sleep. All right. Katie, do we have an answer on the K2 in liver? What's the answer? There is vitamin K in liver. Okay. A lot or a little or? Um, hard to tell hard to at first glance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so liver does have K2, but it's hard to tell how much at first glance. <laughs> Maybe we can it get... Seems, it seems like a lot. It seems like a lot. What's the percent of the uh, daily recommended value? Calculating, so, calculating, calculating. That's okay. We can post <laughs> liver's nutrition facts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on to your diet. Um, I think this is where possibly some of, aside from supplements, this might be where the most fake news comes out about testosterone. People will always say, eat this food to increase testosterone 40%. Yeah, that's not a thing, all right? Like, no food is going to do that. So uh, we'll cover some uh, more general uh, themes in your diet, but uh, if you're trying to increase your testosterone, there's not going to be one magic food that's going to skyrocket your testosterone levels. So uh, in terms of macronutrients, we'll just really quick go over some macronutrients and micronutrients. If the, if the cameras continue to work, that is, I guess. <laughs> um, a 2022 meta-analysis looked at 27 different studies with macronutrients and testosterone. And over a three to four week span, low carb diets resulted in uh, greatly reducing total testosterone. So uh, this, is, this study is not the first time I've heard that. If you talk to anyone that's done the carnivore diet, um, not anyone, but a lot of people that have done carnivore will tell you that their hormone levels start to suffer with no carbs. Uh, so like Paul Saladino is an example of this. He's talked on his podcast before about how his hormone levels started to go down when he was full carnivore and didn't have any carbs. And that's why he started adding honey and berries into his diet. Okay. So does it matter if it's simple or complex? Cause those are simple carbohydrates. Nope. So it doesn't, okay. Nope. Um, and then I guess the next thing that we could talk about would be fat, right? So uh, the 2021 study that I've got here showed that having a low fat diet had a negative effect on testosterone and on other androgens. Um, and anecdotally as well, I can tell you that um, when I took testosterone out of my diet, uh, did I say testosterone? I meant cholesterol. <laughs> yes. When I took cholesterol out of my diet, uh, my testosterone levels plummeted. And the example of this is ranger school. So before ranger school, uh, there's of course, there's other variables there. But before ranger school, I was eating over two grams of cholesterol a day, which is mm. way above the daily recommendation. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they do it in milligrams. Yes. So the fact you're eating grams is yeah, a so lot. <laughs> I was eating over 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day because uh, I eat a lot of eggs. And then in ranger school, if you average out the MRE nutrition facts, I was eating like 180 uh, milligrams of cholesterol. So like 
less than a tenth, drop. less than a tenth of that. Yeah. And uh, my testosterone levels plummeted. Cholesterol is a building block of testosterone, right? So if you're interested more in this, the ebook really goes into how testosterone is made from these different components and it uses analogies to kind of break it down into a like comic book or middle school level mm-hmm. understanding. So um, we won't get into it here just because we don't want this episode to be three hours long like the ebook. But um, <laughs> if you're interested in how uh, this stuff works, please head to the ebook and we will move on. Um, of course, Protein is also important to your testosterone if you want to increase uh, or improve your body composition, right? Because if you want to build muscle, you're going to need protein. And if you want to increase your metabolism and lose fat, you're going to want to build muscle. So Mm -hmm. um, basically, the story we can paint with macronutrients here is that you want a balanced diet. You want Mm -hmm. 30% carbs, 30% fats. 40% 40% protein, or I mean, you can switch out the 30 and the 40 for either of the three macronutrients, whatever's uh, the easiest way for you to get those calories, but um, you want a balanced diet. Yeah. I mean, like that's, that's a general range that I usually hear. And it, I mean, it does vary based on your activity levels. Like somebody who's powerlifting is going to need more protein than somebody who's more sedentary. Mm-hmm. Um, just because that's, that's what muscle or that's how your body use. That's what your body uses to build muscle. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if my throat can, uh, stick with <laughs> us through the, the micronutrient <laughs> section here. Uh, one of the most important micronutrients for testosterone production is zinc. Uh, you've probably, if you've looked at getting supplements for testosterone, you've probably seen zinc on the market. A, uh, a study on, on taking zinc for testosterone levels showed that um, men that only ate 28 to 37% of the daily recommended allowance of zinc saw in eight weeks their testosterone decreased by about 41%. So uh, that pretty clearly shows that zinc is crucial for uh, your body's ability to create testosterone. Mm -hmm. The next uh, micronutrient that we've got is magnesium. So uh, magnesium isn't as directly involved in the production of testosterone as say zinc or cholesterol, the two that we just covered, but uh, magnesium still does, it's still involved in the process of making testosterone. And there have been uh, a lot of studies done that will show a slight correlation in uh, magnesium deficiency with testosterone levels being lower. So um, not as much of a causation with studies showing that limiting this will plummet your testosterone levels like the zinc study we just went over, Mm -hmm. Um, but there's still correlation. And I would say just try not to have low levels of magnesium. It's not not Mm -hmm. that hard. So um, even though the science isn't as clear as like say zinc uh, should still probably try to not be deficient yeah so magnesium's in in electrolyte right yes so so do any of the other ones have any effect on testosterone uh so electrolytes i didn't look into specifically uh how electrolytes affect testosterone levels but if your electrolytes are low it limits the ability of your cells to function properly Mm -hmm. so Um, being deficient in something like electrolytes is probably not optimal Mm -hmm. for your testosterone levels. Okay. The next micronutrient that I've got is selenium. And uh, selenium is also involved in testosterone production, but uh, 0.3% of people are deficient in selenium. So it's not really something you have to worry about. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Boron is the last mineral that we'll cover here. And uh, boron is also involved in the conversion of cholesterol to testosterone, just like zinc. Uh, The thing with boron is that a lot of the claims made about it are kind of like overhyping how critical it is. So um, like this study that I've got here shows a large increase in testosterone. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's done in postmenopausal women. So 
that's not a very good study for mm -hmm. what we're looking at. And then another study shows a 3.75%, which is very small, increase in testosterone. Uh, and it's done on a very small population of eight people. So like the studies on boron just like aren't very conclusive. So although it is involved, uh, I'd say it's not something you have to worry about as much as something like zinc. Okay. And then uh, the last micronutrient is vitamin D, but we've got an entire section for that. So we'll hit that in a minute. <laughs> we do. And that's one of my sections. So I can give your, your voice a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last part of diet that we'll focus on before jumping over to vitamin D is body composition. Cause I feel like that's related to diet. So if you're looking at a healthy range for your body composition, um, for men, you probably want to be somewhere around 10 to 12%. Uh, wider range could be anywhere from eight to 17% is probably like a healthy range, um, based off just statistics for, uh, chronic disease and, uh, lower testosterone levels. So, uh, the closer you can get to like a 10 to 12% kind of range, I think the better, but, um, obviously your lifestyle will fluctuate as you go through life. So as long as you're staying somewhere between like eight to 17%, I would say, uh, you're not going to be hurting your testosterone levels. You start to get out in front of that or behind that, and your testosterone levels will probably be impacted by your body composition. Mm -hmm. A 2008 study I've got here was done on about 2,000 men, so good population, and uh, their testosterone and their symptoms was heavily associated with their waist circumference. So... This shows um, like a lot of studies done on weight and testosterone will look at just weight, but like BMI, um, weight isn't the best indicator because someone could have a lot of muscle and mm -hmm. they could weigh more than someone that has a higher body fat percentage. So uh, this study showed that having a waist circumference um, 20 centimeters larger <clears throat> was a much better uh, predictor of low testosterone than BMI was. So uh, if you can keep your waist circumference down, uh, you'll have, it'll have a better impact on testosterone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I butchered that, but <laughs> <laughs> move on to the, uh, the next statistic because I don't have all these studies in front of me. So I'm just trying to uh, go off of mostly what I remember. Um, the next one that we can talk about, I guess, is, uh, vitamin D, vitamin D. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, most of mine is on sunscreen cause I don't exactly know how vitamin D works in the body. Um, but like a lot of people really encourage the use of sunscreen, a for skin health and B to avoid skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I don't really use sunscreen when I do. I try to use a zinc-based sunscreen um, because your skin is a second mouth. So if you wouldn't put something in your mouth, you really shouldn't be putting it on your skin. And sunscreen is filled with chemicals. And I didn't know that zinc increases your testosterone. Mm -hmm. And one and a great sun blocker is zinc. So if you're going to use sunscreen, try to use a zinc-based uh, sunscreen and it also might increase your <laughs> testosterone, but it's also really important to get, um, sun on your bare skin because, um, sunscreen does block like some of the vitamin D absorption. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just learned that. I think Katie actually told me that it's, um, it's in the ebook as well. Which, oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, Cause we got that question. You asked me that question during the micronutrient episode. So, um, when I was going over the studies for the testosterone ebook, I looked into that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get to that, I uh, just wanted to mention something with the body composition. Uh, two things are if you're in a long-term calorie deficit, a study on being in a long-term calorie deficit showed that it decreased testosterone production by about 36% uh, because your body isn't getting as many nutrients and it, thinks it might be starving. I guess people, a lot of people would say, uh, so making sure that your body is well fed and getting the nutrients it needs is important. And then another study where obese men lost 50 pounds showed that over the course of 12 weeks, their testosterone levels doubled. Uh, so 
that gives you a good indication of just how much uh, losing weight and getting to a healthier body composition can impact your testosterone levels. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to keep going on the sunscreen or? Um, yeah, sure. You can go back to sunscreen. Okay. And um, aside from zinc, I've also heard that coconut oil works pretty well. Um, I haven't used that myself, but just something I've read. Um, and then back to skin cancer a little bit. The five-year survival rate for stage one skin cancer is 98.4%. So especially once I get older, I'm going to start getting checked, you know, once a year prevention. Um and then also on skin cancer, um, Ted, if you can explain this to me, I would appreciate it. But sunscreen use is up, time in the sun is down, and skin cancer is up. Yes. So, <laughs> like, math math ain't mathin' again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean... That doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. So, there's probably other factors at play mm-hmm. uh, because cancer in general is up, so... Uh, There's other environmental factors at play there, but um, I can't really speak as much to that, but I agree it doesn't make sense. (laughs) Yeah, and Um, and one of our later episodes, we talk about statistics a little bit and confounding mm -hmm. variables, and there could be some of that going on. Absolutely. Um, But, I mean, just those three, like, together just doesn't really make much sense. Um, And then there's also the profit motive for the, because they are largely made by pharmaceutical companies, like, J and J makes a lot of sunscreen, um, and they had one pulled off the market a couple of years ago um, for actually causing leukemia. And do you want to guess what their number one source of revenue is? Leukemia drugs. Treating leukemia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's the number one. Um, it's how it goes sometimes with, yeah. the, with the pharma companies. Yeah. Um, regarding sunscreen and absorption. Uh, The studies on that are very interesting because on laboratory studies um, where they use like an artificial light inside, they'll show that the sunscreen will block those UVB rays. Okay. However, when they do larger studies and they have people report back to them on their own sunscreen use, uh, it doesn't show that sunscreen use lowers vitamin D, uh, but from reading different studies, uh, it seemed like it was probably user error for like application of sunscreen. People not really mm-hmm. covering themselves with sunscreen or not if the people that are going out in the sun that use sunscreen, a lot of those people weren't reapplying. Mm-hmm. So they were still getting enough time in the sun where it wasn't impairing their, their t- uh, vitamin D levels. Does okay. Sense? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, overall studies are inconclusive, but one could reason that, uh, based off the lab studies that sunscreen probably does reduce your skin's ability to absorb the UVB rays and create vitamin D. And in the ebook, we go uh, a little deeper into just how vitamin D is made from the UVB rays hitting your skin and activating a cholesterol, uh, compound. So if you want the comic book explanation of uh how that works make sure you head to our website and get the ebook yeah yeah so just to summarize that a little bit um i know my holistic doctor said to try to get 15 to 20 minutes of direct sunlight Mm -hmm. onto your skin every day and then after that if you want to use a zinc based sunscreen that doesn't have i used to know the name of the chemical um but just something that is zinc based Mm -hmm. yeah um so my mom has been buying us zinc-based sunscreen for a long time. So uh, when Nick and I went to the beach one time for 4th of July, we had a bunch of people in town, including uh, my sister Katie, who's here helping produce the show today. And I had already burned. So my body was already like bright red. And then when I put the zinc on, we call it caspering ourselves because you turn white like a ghost because it's so pasty and so thick and doesn't really rub in. And because of my red underneath and the slight blue tint of the white, I turned this like purple <laughs> shade. <laughs> yep, was, same exact thing happened sight. to me. My, I mean, my skin just has like a reddish hue to it kind of. And anytime I put the zinc sunscreen on, I turn purple. <laughs> I look like like I have some sort of <laughs> genetic disorder. <laughs> uh, some factors we can talk about real quick with 
uh, your sunlight absorption is uh, UV index. Depending on where you are located, uh, the higher the UV index, the less time you need in the sun. Um, next, we've got clothing. A lot of people will go outside to get sunlight, but then they'll keep themselves almost completely covered in clothes. And the less of your body and your skin that's absorbed to the sun, the less vitamin D you're going to expose. So uh, this might be an unpopular opinion, but um, like I think people should walk around like shirtless more. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> when I go on walks, I'll often just walk around shirtless. I'm comfortable with my shirt off, I guess. So um, maybe if you're, I could see how some people might not be as comfortable. Um, but I think that generally getting a tan on your whole body is going to be healthy for you and that you should do that if you live in a climate where you're able to do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a pretty easy in Charles. So I just have to go to the beach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it is harder, especially in the Northern States. Like when I was in Wisconsin in the winter, I was not getting much sun no. yeah you, don't, you have to supplement so um, another thing we can talk about is like i've got latitude on here and anytime you're above 33 degrees north or below 33 degrees south um, your skin won't make any vitamin d in the winter mm. so i mean that's right now we might be right around 33 uh, degrees north where we are right now so um yeah i mean Especially if you're up far north, like Canada or like northern United States, there's going to be like four, five, six months a year where you're not going to be producing vitamin D from the sun. So it is important in the winter to supplement with vitamin D. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is the time of day. The closer to 12 o'clock noon, uh, the more of those UVB rays your skin is able to absorb. So the further away from you get from noon, uh, the more time you need to spend out in the sun. And as far as windows go, windows block UVB rays. So if you're inside and you're sunbathing through the window, like uh, like a cat or a dog might do, uh, you're not getting those UVB rays. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, would you like to move on from vitamin D and go on to stress? Yeah, so I mean, we have an entire episode on this. That's that true. Will we be coming out stress. soon. We want to skip it. Is okay. that after the the, the no. testosterone or before? No, it should be right before actually. Okay, so we just went over stress. So uh, go check that episode out. I think it's episode twenty eight, if I remember correctly. Twenty nine, twenty eight, twenty nine. Yeah, somewhere so, there. Uh, go back an episode or two. Check out the deep dive we did on stress for. Uh, more information it's that camera <laughs> our cameras are just giving wow. us a heck of a time here this weekend mm -hmm. all right skipping past stress we've got supplements so real quickly i'll just go over a few supplements here and let you know if they're worth considering taking or not because i know a lot of people try to increase their testosterone levels through supplements there's a reason that this is uh number six on our list here. It's not the most important thing. It might move the needle a little bit, but uh, for a lot of people, if you're not getting those big rocks in place, um, you should probably do those first before you head to supplements. Because if you're only getting four hours of sleep, you can take supplements, but it's not gonna do as much as getting eight hours of sleep a night will do. Mm -hmm. All right, so we already talked about vitamin D. Um, if you're not getting vitamin D, a very common dose is five or 10,000 IU of vitamin D a day. So uh, whether it's winter or if you get your vitamin D levels checked, <clears throat> very common lab, uh, 25 OHD. If it's under 30, you should probably be supplementing with vitamin D. I like to see that closer to around 50. So uh, very easy blood lab to get done. Uh, the next thing we've got is zinc. Um, I always recommend people get their micronutrients through whole foods because as we talked about in episode 22 and 23, some of these micronutrients have uh, complex relationships with others, right? So if you're taking something like zinc, you have to be careful about not depleting your copper levels. So uh, for zinc, 
it's better to go through whole food sources and just eat a diet that has oysters or seafood or red meat or eggs or dairy um, or even a little bit of dark chocolate uh, will have some zinc in it. But um, again, episode 22 and 23, deep dives on vitamins and minerals. The first real supplement we've got here is ashwagandha. So I've got ashwagandha as number one because I think it has the most evidence behind it based off the studies that I went through. Uh, A very recent study from 2022 was eight weeks long on 21 to 45 year old men. That's basically the perfect population that we're looking for in terms of uh, this topic. So um, these males were able to increase their testosterone 72 nanograms per deciliter on average through taking ashwagandha. And this was 16.5% higher than placebo. So that's a pretty substantial increase. Uh, I mean, 72 nanograms per deciliter, if you consider the reference range is 300 to 1,000 mm. right now for testosterone, that's a considerable increase. I mean, that, that's very large. So mm. um We've talked about ashwagandha a couple times before on the podcast. I think we mentioned it in the stress episode. Um, If you are going to take some sort of herbal test booster, I would make sure it's got ashwagandha in it, or you might just be overpaying for some pixie dust fillers. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do you have any more supplements coming up, or is that just about? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got more studies, but... If you uh, we're going very shallow here, the ebook is where a lot more of the meat is, a lot more of the the studies that I dive into. But I'll hit up ecdysteroids. Have you heard of like tricasterone? Mm-mm. No. Okay. So tricasterone or ecdysteroids are structurally similar to testosterone, um, but it's found in insects. So some people think that because this similar molecule is an androgen in uh, like an insect, it might also behave like testosterone in humans. Uh, The evidence doesn't really show that. Every 10 years or so, (laughs) ecdysteroids get really popular. But uh, I am personally of the opinion based off the evidence that the supplements that people claim are ecdysteroids that are working for them are probably just laced with steroids. <laughs> <laughs> that is my personal opinion. Um, I've got a 2006 eight week study here that showed no improvement in body composition or strength or testosterone. So I'd rather spend the money on vitamin D zinc mm-hmm. or even AC to cool your bed. <laughs> Um, on, on the supplements, do you want to share quick thoughts on TRT? Yeah. Um, I would not recommend it for young men. So if you're an older male, um, and you have low testosterone levels, TRT can be a game changer for you. But, um, most people that go on TRT, testosterone replacement therapy will not recover the ability to really produce Uh, enough testosterone. So um, I would always try to increase your testosterone naturally first. And that's what the ebook is all about. Naturally increasing your testosterone levels uh, through all these different steps. So are you basically stuck on TRT once you start it? If you go for long enough? A lot of people are. Most people are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it winds up impacting the signal (laughs) that your uh, brain sends to uh, your balls to produce testosterone, right? Okay. So things like uh, luteinizing hormone, which signal your uh, testicles to produce testosterone, stop being produced uh, up by the brain when mm. you take a, an exogenous testosterone. Okay. Uh, the next supplement we've got here is fenugreek. This is a, another ancient Ayurvedic medicine or herbal, uh, just like ashwagandha. And fenugreek, I'd actually never heard of before I started the testosterone ebook. But there were quite a few studies I came across um, that showed it did increase testosterone. Um, There were other studies that measured just uh, fertility parameters in men. Um, But for all of these different 
supplements, I didn't look at the different uh, fertility metrics like sperm and stuff like that because that's different from testosterone. <clears throat> so um, a study that I came across uh, showed a 12% increase, I think, in testosterone. Um, and that was already with a very high baseline. The baseline testosterone before the study started was 523. Uh, most of these studies on testosterone are done on people with low testosterone. So whenever I come across a study where the people in the study have a like normal or high testosterone mm -hmm. level, it provides uh, more of a possibility that a supplement work for someone like you or me that doesn't have low testosterone. Yeah, here here we got to like really differentiate between um, average and healthy, I think, mm -hmm. because they can kind of be misconstrued as the same thing. But in, in the case of testosterone, it's not. Yes. So that's a good point. Like the reference range that we've been citing <laughs> that's commonly used is 300 to 1000 nanograms per deciliter for testosterone. Uh, it used to be higher, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But um, because of the average levels of people today, I mean, like 300, most people are not going to be feeling great at 300 or at 400 uh, or even at 500. I can tell you how I felt when my levels were at like 400, 500. I felt absolutely terrible compared to when they're up at 800 or higher. So um, with testosterone, it is different person to person in terms of how your levels affect and your symptoms are correlated. Okay. All right, moving on from uh, fenugreek, which I think based off the study shows a strong possibility of yielding results is boron citrate. So I mentioned boron earlier, so I won't spend too much time on it, but a 2011 study showed large increases in free testosterone, um, but a very negligible shift in total testosterone. And when I started looking at other studies uh, for boron increasing testosterone, the studies I was coming across were done on postmenopausal women. So, um, all in all, if you're looking at increasing free testosterone, boron may have some application, but I don't think it's uh, worth spending your money for in just increasing testosterone in general. And um, this ebook and this episode are focused more on total testosterone levels. I guess maybe um, in another episode we'll go into free testosterone versus total testosterone. We can definitely do that if people want. Uh, next quick supplement we've got here is Shilajit. So <clears throat> our friend Kevin Nowacki, uh, I'm not sure if he still does, but he used to take Shilajit and I'd never heard of it before him. Um, but basically it comes from like the mud and like the rocks and the decomposition of plants in the Himalayas. So it's just like a blend of all these minerals and decomposed matter. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Um, a study that measured Shilajit impact on testosterone, it was a 90 day study. It was the only study I found. So, um, not as credible as something like ashwagandha that has a lot of studies behind it, but, uh, it did increase the testosterone of healthy middle-aged men by 20%. As I said, though, only one testosterone, hard to really, uh, say whether or not it's effective based off just one study. Mm-hmm. Um, is that all that you really got for the supplements or do you have anything else left? Um, there are a few other supplements like ginger, ginseng, and Tomcat mm -hmm. Ali. But if you want to learn about those, go to the ebook. E yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you have lifestyle written down. Is there anything that you also want to cover for lifestyle? I mean, this is all essentially lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I would say let's have people head to the ebook for lifestyle changes. We can go over some of the things we cover, but uh, we are running out of time here. So yes. some of the topics we cover with lifestyle is uh, microplastics, tap water, um, shampoo, fragrances, shampoo, different endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, pesticides, sunscreen, uh, sunscreen, EMFs even. Uh, there's some studies there. So that stuff is not witchcraft actually uh, does have a little impact. But again, 
we're now seventh on the list. So these are things that have much less of an impact than uh, lifting or getting quality sleep or eating a balanced diet with uh, enough micronutrients and macronutrients to support testosterone levels. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that should just about wrap it up. Ted, yep. Ted and Alex have some engagement pictures to be <laughs> taken tonight in Nashville. So we are being cued to get ready to go. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, if you want to learn more, please hit us up for that ebook. You can go to weightsandwealth.com uh, or you can DM us on social media and we will get that to you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining us today at Weights and Wealth. And don't forget to apply today's lessons to live healthy and wealthy. If this conversation will contribute to your fitness and financial gains, please share it with a friend or family member and give a five-star review so more people can lift bigger weights and get bigger bank accounts.